Yeah. Uh, we'll bring you that draw from the qualifiers in a couple of minutes' time. Mossy, thanks for joining us this morning. Sure. And plenty more Gaelic games coming your way on the radio tonight from uh, seven with Joe and the lads. Uh, now, let's move on to the Women's World Cup. Ruth Fahey is with us. Um, uh, how did you describe them? A, a perfect team of shithousery was how Owen <laughs> talked about Cameroon. Um, and, well, that was one of the all-time great World Cup shithousing performances. Yeah, I think you've captured it quite, quite well there with the word shithousery. It was absolutely bizarre I have to say and it's such a pity because the weekend was so dramatic so full of good things like there was an absolutely unbelievable game on Saturday evening between Norway and Australia and the high that everyone was on after that and then we came to England Cameroon the first game on Sunday and I don't know if you see the result but it was absolutely bizarre it was actually it wasn't a poor game in the opening 30 minutes England went 1-0 up uh, they were fairly comfortable and then it went two goals up by Ellen White it was actually initially called as offside, and of course, VAR was utilised. Then the overturn decided that it was a goal. It was actually a lovely little through ball by Bronze and a nice finish by White. But after that, Cameroon just lost their mind. Basically, absolutely lost their mind. They actually briefly refused to restart the game um, when tip off was happening. They just stood in a circle and were gesturing and pointing at the big screen, which I couldn't get my head around because the big screen was actually showing that it was the correct call. It was really marginal by Ellen White. But she was onside, and it was an unbelievable finish. Wouldn't, re- wouldn't restart the game. Uh, shit Shithousery, left, right and centre. Then in the second half, Cameroon players actually got even worse. They scored Ajara in the shoe, who was potentially the biggest tantrum holder on the pitch. Scored a decent goal. VAR was utilised again. It was showed offside. And at this stage, she absolutely just lost her mind. She was in tears balling on the side of the pitch. Their manager was giving her hugs, trying to uh, lift her back up. And it was just bizarre, bizarre. England ultimately won 3-0 in the end, but they were just seen that right and centre. And as you said earlier in your show, Neville had some really strong words after it, and he was ashamed it wasn't football. And if England players would never behave like that, but if they did, they would never, ever play for England again. Basically, so yeah, it wasn't good to watch. It wasn't good to watch at all. And yet, I mean, every World Cup has a... Um a team who are the villains of it, and it becomes one of the stories. Like the Cameroon team who kicked uh, Diego Maradona off the field in the opening game of the, was that the 1990 World Cup? Uh, like, you know, this, this is uh, footballing, yeah, like, I, I, you know, it's great, I think. It really, yeah. this actually <laughs> yeah. is, this kind of stuff makes World Cups worth watching. Yeah, like, I'd say Nikita Paris, who got a crack of the elbow into the face, wouldn't say it's great, or probably Alex Green would have got spot in the arm, wouldn't say it's great. But, like, you are right, it was great to watch. It, in the end, it was initially entertaining, I have to say. It got a bit awkward, like, when they just wouldn't restart the game. The whole team came to the side, gesturing at the screen. Like, the manager was losing his mind as well, hugging the players, trying to, je- like, G them back up to play. So it did get awkward and embarrassing at a stage, like, to have a villain is okay, and there are certain moments in the game where there was villainry, and that was part of it, but then it just got to a level where, yeah, it wasn't good to watch. It wasn't good to watch, and Neville actually said that after it, like, just for girls watching around the world, it was just, I just thought it was, I think unprofessional is probably the best word, where you can kind of split it in two, you can say the villainry on the, on the pitch, that was obviously a tactic that they wanted to utilise, and it worked in a sense for a certain part of the game, but the protests and refusing to restart, and especially when the two goals were actually correctly called. It was just really strange, and uh, they're getting absolutely, yeah, they're getting absolutely mobbed in the press today, yeah. and rightly so. But England, to be honest, won't care. They'll move on, and, and they're going to come up potentially against uh, USA. Mm. We, we can chat about that in just a moment, but yesterday seemed like a, a really iconic uh, day in the World Cup because of the crazy scenes you had in that england Cameroon game, but also this impassioned interview and the quotes through translation that we got from Marta from Brazil afterwards and the passion with which she spoke, the heartbreak uh, that was on show there, uh, it felt like one of those instantly iconic moments in terms of somebody speaking after uh, a huge moment, obviously in a negative way from a Brazil perspective, after what was France further rubber stamping their potential as World Cup champions at home. Yeah, exactly, and that's actually a really good point to pull up on. Uh, the second game was superb, France of the edge, Brazil 2-1, after extra time, it was a really good game in terms of how tight it was. I don't, don't think France really got into fifth gear. Brazil, I think, left everything on the pitch. And because of that, that's what my, my washer was so fired up in the post-match issues. As soon as she started speaking, everyone was crying out, asking for a translation. But you could just tell by the way she was speaking that she was crying out for something to do with the public. And essentially what she was saying is, look, 
the likes of myself, Marta, who she's 33 now, like she likely won't be back at another World Cup. She might prove us wrong in one sense because her teammate for me is 41. I'm pulling the strings at centre mid, so she might be there as well. But Marta basically said, look, Marta won't be here. For me, give attention, won't be here again. We need young girls in Brazil to step up and pull women's football up from where it is currently in Brazil. So, and yeah, really passionate speech to the cameras. And this, so I'm just looking at the images around today. It's one sense is the English team getting absolutely beaten up by Cameroon and the other one is Marta just gesturing really passionately at the cameras. And it was a really iconic moment and it's sad that Brazil are out. I think once we saw that kind of route for Brazil, I'm glad that they're not going on to play USA because I think USA need to play someone like France in the next round. Uh, but yeah, it was an iconic moment and it's sad to see her go, but Marta... She's been outrageous. Like she's been the poster girl for women's football for the last decade or more. Um, but that might be the last time we'll see her on the pitch for yeah, Brazil. The France kind of needed to win as well. At the same time, just to a home team needs to make it to as deep as they possibly can. So they're more than likely going to face uh, America next, right? Yeah, exactly. So USA Spain is on today, five p.m. I think USA will cruise over Spain. They've got a really nice draw there. And then what we're most like looking at on Friday is France versus USA, which will be the pick of the quarterfinals for me. You're looking at potentially whoever wins that could go on and get to the final and lift the trophy. Um, so for France, they've been absolutely tested. I thought they, I thought for a moment that Brazil were going to do it yesterday and edge them out, but they've had some really tough games. They've had to play Norway, Brazil. Whereas the USA haven't really been tested. Their hardest uh, match was against Sweden, where they're comfortable 2-0 two, two winners. I think they're going to be fine today against Spain. And then come Friday, they'll, be, they'll have to lift their game in multifold. So that'll be a whole different story. Like This is the legacy of the 13-0 thing against Thailand. And the thing that I don't actually understand about people saying USA should stop scoring goals. And to be fair, <laughs> I think most of the discourse is around the celebrations. But when it comes to the scoring goals, surely there's a part of every person's opposition, even if it is this ridiculously strong France team coming up against them that is thinking... Christ, this team has firepower like potentially no other team has had in this competition. Yeah, hundred percent. Like that, hundred percent. I'm totally with you there. And the you can't stop scoring goals. And, and what what's going to happen is obviously France are going to pick apart every single one of those goals in their prep for, for potentially for Friday's game. They're going to analyze how they score them. And the fact is, these weren't thirteen like, soft goals. Alex Morgan's five finishes are absolutely world class. And they're going to look at that. And of course, they're going to know, but. France have no fear. They still ha they still haven't stretched out their quality either yet. Uh, like I said, I know they edged Brazil last night, but they were. I say they're most of the game. They were. They looked of, certainly of a higher quality. Uh, Henri got the goal in extra time. For me, she's been one of the players of the tournament so far, and she's got another gear to step up as well. They've so much depth. Like Govine, who has literally put her name in lights in this tournament. She didn't even start the first game. She's come in twenty two. Montpellier striker. She's absolutely superb. Number thirteen. You'll see her on Friday. And then they've got the likes of Cascarino to bring on, who's, again, like a really young, exciting player. So they've loads of depth, but like USA are in a different level. We've heard them speaking in the last week or so that they could actually play their first team and their second team and claim to still have the two best teams in the world, which actually isn't an unfair comment to make. Like they have, they're just, I don't want to say in a different level because I haven't been, like I said, tested yet. So we don't actually know. But I think that game on Friday is going to tell us who's going to win the tournament. All right. Ruth, great stuff. Thanks a million for joining us. Thanks. Thanks a million, guys. Happy Monday. Bye. You too. Ruth Fahey joined us there after um, a very interesting weekend in the Women's World Cup. Try and get your, um, if you haven't seen any of the Cameroon fallout. I mean, obviously it's terrible. We need to condemn it in the strongest possible terms, but like, yeah, this is the